Welcome back, everybody. So we've got a patient who has had an MI, okay? We have run them through the ER. We have diagnosed them. We have sent them off either for PCI or thrombolysis. We've put a stent in, and now we've admitted them to the hospital. What do we do now? What do we do as we're seeing this patient who's had an MI yesterday, two days ago, they're in the hospital, um, what do we do? Uh, you got to know this because these patients don't just go home after they get a stent. Okay, we have to watch these patients in the hospital. All right, so we're going to talk about how we do that. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or in the I button in the upper right-hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated. Definitely feel free to subscribe to my channel and you'll get notifications every time I put a new video up. All right, so this is pretty much it right here. So after we do our intervention to revascularize the patient, either through PCI, if we have access to it, or through thrombolysis, we admit these patients and obviously we admit them to the ICU. Why? Because one of the big complications of these patients is fatal arrhythmias. All right, so we need these patients on continuous cardiac monitoring, and really the only place we can do that is in the ICU. So these patients will be admitted to the ICU with continuous cardiac monitoring. Now that said, on CCS, you got to know the disposition. So you, you know after somebody's had a PCI, you do not send them home, okay? You got to put them in the ICU for monitoring for at least a few days. All right, and the reason we say a few days is because usually if you have a fatal arrhythmia, it will be within those first few days. So that is really what we're looking out for. Now, as far as medications, a lot of this stuff we just continue uh, from our initial management. So we have dual action or uh, dual action platelet therapy, all right? So aspirin and a P2Y12 inhibitor. Why are those so good together? Well, remember that aspirin is an inhibitor of the COX enzyme, which reduces thromboxane A2. Remember what that's for? That is for platelet aggregation. Now, the P2Y12 inhibitors, what they are responsible for is blocking that P2Y12, which is a receptor that, uh, I'll just write it here, it's a receptor that activates platelets. So we're going after platelet activation and aggregation. So we're hitting it in two spots, reducing the risk of a platelet clot. We put these patients on ACE inhibitors, we put them on a beta blocker, and if they're hypertensive, actively hypertensive, they'll be on an IV beta blocker. Otherwise, we put them on an oral beta blocker. These patients will be on beta blockers for the rest of their life. We'll get to that when we talk about outpatient management. These patients will be on a statin. They need to be on a uh, high dose statin, and uh, our goal is to get their LDL to uh, under 70 in most instances. And if you are unable to do that on a high dose statin, you would add a zetamibe uh, to that. But um, generally in the inpatient setting, we're not constantly looking at the LDL because it takes some time uh, for those to work. So we'll get more to statins when we talk about outpatient management. We're gonna continue heparin or low molecular weight heparin. Um, and how do we monitor to make sure they're properly anticoagulated? Well, with heparin, we monitor the PTT, okay? When do we monitor PT? When they're on warfarin therapy. Now, these patients will eventually, many of them will eventually go on to need warfarin long-term. Then we monitor the PT. But with heparin therapy, we monitor the PTT. And then these patients should have pain control, morphine, and nitrates. So that's really important too, because we want to make sure that we're making these patients as comfortable as possible. If you're uncomfortable, your heart's going to work harder and it's going to need more oxygen. And that is the last thing we want the heart to need or to, to do uh, while these patients are recovering from an MI. We want to give their heart a rest. So morphine and nitrates, and those are PRN. So we do not uh, force this onto patients. If they're having pain, they can take it. If they don't have pain, they don't need it. Uh, supportive therapy, uh, this is just 
kind of not related to fixing their heart, um, but that would be sedation. Again, kind of for the same reasons, we wanna keep them comfortable, so we use benzodiazepines for that. Uh, and then a stool softener. We don't want them straining. Again, raises your blood pressure. Uh, further workup, we're gonna do echo to assess their ejection fraction. Uh, and then we want to keep an eye on their electrolytes, BMP and magnesium. Why? Because electrolyte derangements raise your risk of uh, an arrhythmia. And that is the last thing we want because that is already a big high risk for them. Uh, if they uh, have an arrhythmia, that's, I mean, that's one of the most common causes of death in an MI patient. So we want to make sure that that's not gonna happen. And one of the ways that we can do that is to make sure that their electrolytes are all within normal limits. So uh, recheck those electrolytes. I would say probably every six to 12 hours, we wanna keep an eye on that. And these are the sources for the previous slide. They kind of got cut off. Now, I wanna point out that the most significant prognostic factor for survival after an MI is left ventricular ejection fraction. So take a look here. Um, this is, so what you see here is uh, the ejection fraction on the x-axis and on the y-axis you see cardiac mortality. As you can see, um, as we go further and further um, down the ejection fraction, so going this way, you can see that the mortality goes up, okay? So um, if your ejection fraction is, you know, in that nice 60 to 70 range, um, you can see that the mortality is like three or four or five percent. Whereas if they're in the 20s, um, that mortality rate goes up to 20 to 30 percent. And that's after one year, okay? Now, the complications I uh, go into in, well, it's, I have a video up, but I will revamp it in uh, uh, a future video. It should be in the next couple days. Um, so within 48 hours, it's reinfarction, 5 to 10% of patients, and arrhythmias. Arrhythmias is the big one. Now, 90% of MI patients will develop an arrhythmia, at least for a, a sh in the short term. Um, usually that's okay. Um, however, some of them, like VFib, can be really, really bad, okay? So this can precipitate sudden death. That is why we are keeping an eye on those electrolytes. Within days to weeks, we look at uh, contractile and mechanical dysfunction. So contractile dysfunctions can cause congestive heart failure or shock. Uh, mechanical dysfunctions can lead also to sudden death, but for slightly different reasons. Again, I'll go into these in a future video. Uh, and then weeks to months, we think of post-infarction pericarditis like Dressler syndrome. So. What I want you to get from this, at least right now, is that let's say you get a vignette, it's an MI patient, they're being hospitalized, they're being treated, everything's fine, and then sudden death, they died. You come in the next morning, nurse tells you they died overnight. What's the most likely cause? Well, if you're dealing with a patient and it's a day after their MI, think of an arrhythmia, fatal arrhythmia like VFib. If you're dealing with a patient three or four days after their MI, maybe you're getting ready to discharge them, uh, think of something like a free wall rupture, okay? That will precipitate sudden death as well. So the timing can be important and they may get after that on your exam. These are the sources. And this is a timeline. Again, this is stuff we'll go into in uh, my whole video uh, on complications of MI. So to recap, after MI, patients should be stabilized, admitted to the ICU or CCU, doesn't matter. Uh, initial therapy includes ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, dual action platelet therapy, uh, which includes both aspirin and a P2Y12 inhibitor, um, which by the way is clopidogrel, ticagrelor, and so forth. Um, then we want them on heparin and pain control as needed. Supportive therapy, stool softeners, and benzos. A patient should get an echocardiogram at some point while they're in the hospital to assess for left ventricular ejection fraction. Short-term complications, like I said, arrhythmias, contractile, and mechanical dysfunction. Uh, be aware of the signs and symptoms for all these. Again, I've got this in a separate video. Long-term complications are congestive heart failure. That's really the big one. That's why we uh, monitor these patients long-term, as well as pericarditis.